evening and welcome to the Silicon Valley Entrepreneur, a series of conversations with startup founders and the investors who fund them. I'm Chris Gill, CEO of SV Forum, the largest organization for technologists and entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley. Tonight, I'm delighted to have with me two, two very interesting people, Ron Lichty, uh, who has uh, been uh, with SV Forum for longer than I have mm -hmm. as, a, as a volunteer and as a board member at one time, and Mickey Mantle, who are co-authors of this book, Managing the Unmanageable, which uh, is about how you manage programmers. And this is a fascinating topic because I come from that background, going back a long way, and having read the book, a lot of it resonated with me. But just to start off, programming has been around for 50, 60 years. Why did you think it was necessary to write a book like this? The, the odd thing is that, uh, and, and we went out, both of, us, both of us started as programmers. We became managers. And the traditional way that, that you become a manager is somebody comes along and says, uh, you know, we need another manager. You're a good programmer. You have, they may or may not have recognized that you have some people skills. And, uh, and, and they say, oh, why don't you be the manager? There's, there's very seldom any management training. So that's the first reason. The second reason is, is we went out and, and, and both of us as managers looked for, for how do we learn this stuff. There's very little out there in the way of books that are specific to managing programmers. So there are a lot of books on, on project manage, management. There's a ton of books on, on Agile and Lean and Process and, sort of thing. Yeah, yep. process sort of stuff. And then there's a ton of books that are general management books that are that everyone's idea is you can just apply these to managing programmers. Mm -hmm. But but there's the uniqueness of of what we do, of this craft that is programming that's that's neither engineering nor art, that's but that has elements of both. And you you can literally count the number of books that are about that on on the fingers of both hands and, and then you run out and, and, and you know there's there aren't that many okay so Mickey what why are programmers so difficult to manage why are they viewed as the unmanageable well you know um, I think part of the process or part of the issue is the fact that uh, software is intangible okay okay it's it's uh, thought stuff as one of the uh, quotes in the book says and so how do you actually measure a program? Well, you, you can look at code, but often, you know, the program's got to be complete before you can tell whether it actually works. So as opposed to mechanical engineering or electrical engineering where you make, you make a board, you make a chip, you can do uh, testing on the chi chip, software, it's a little bit different kind of uh, process and methodology completely. And, and quite frankly, it's just less tangible. Okay, so what qualified you guys to write this book? <laughs> Can, well, tell me a little bit about the, your <clears throat> backgrounds and, and, and how you came to do this. Well, we should probably say our backgrounds of how we met each other. The, um, um, I, I actually interviewed with Mickey. I had been managing the uh, software development at uh, Berkeley Systems, which did screensavers, After right. Dark and uh, Flying Toasters and Fish. Um, and Mickey was managing development at Broaderbund, <clears throat> and Broaderbund mm -hmm. was was doing the kids software and the entertainment software and some some uh, popular consumer tools. And they were, I, I think, between the two of us, we were probably managing. There, probably, of all of the consumers in the world, there probably eighty percent of them were using, maybe even ninety percent of them were using stuff that that our development teams were doing. Um, I left Berkeley Systems and went to talk to Mickey about coming to Broaderbund. I didn't do that, mm -hmm. but we struck up a friendship there that uh, that has lasted for 20 years. And as Ron said early on, we both started out as programmers. Uh, right. And in fact, one of the things we think is that you know to really be a great manager of programmers, you have to have been a programmer. Uh, you you. It's not a hard and fast rule, of course, but in fact, I think it helps a lot to understand the mentality. Uh, so I started out as a programmer in the early 70s and was a systems programmer. Uh, and eventually, as Ron said, uh, someone had to fill a vacuum. We needed some management. I stepped in, filled that vacuum, been managing software people ever since. And, and, and give me some, some idea of the arc of where you've been. What sort of, ha, sure. ha, 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 how many people you've managed? I mean, Ron, you already said you were on stuff that 
80, 90 percent of the people in the world have been using. I mean, that's huge. What sort of stuff have you been involved in? So my making? first my first uh, projects were much smaller than that. I was actually at a, at a high tech uh, computer graphics company mm -hmm. back when there were only a handful of people in the world who actually did computer graphics. Mm -hmm. um, Evans and Sutherland, uh, their company uh, that was the, uh, the forerunner of silicon graphics in the valley here. Oh right, yes. Um, and so after that, I joined a company called Pixar. You may have heard of them. Pixar, yes, uh, I think I know that name. Where I managed their external software products. Right and development of their external software products. Then I joined the company called Broderbund Software that Ron mentioned, and then a company called Gracenote, which you may not have heard of, but if you have an iPod, you've used the software. Believe me, we license it to Apple. Oh, is that right? Okay. So you both got extensive co careers in software, extensive careers in managing software projects and in managing programmers. Why are programmers so difficult to manage? You know, it's it's... I, you know, I think Mickey was answering that question, and it's and it's the it's the fact that it's neither engineering nor art, but it combines both of those pieces. And we've also always found that, for example, some of the best programmers are musicians. Uh -huh. Okay, uh, and I personally have I'm a musician myself, so I can relate mm -hmm. to that. Uh, I think it's part of the discipline you learn as a musician, but also the creativity, the left brain activity that you have to have as a musician spills over in writing creative code. It, it's a creative process. Okay, so you, you decided to do this book because there was nothing there. How long has it taken you to pr produce this book? We've been working on it for eight years. Eight wow. years of evenings and weekends. But to go back even a little bit further, my first, the first genesis uh, of the yeah. thought uh, is a cliche, but it's long before it was a cliche. One of my programmers told me, you know, managing programmers is a lot like herding cats. And I went, wow, does that really nail the process of managing a programmer? Okay, uh, cats are very difficult, independent. You have to be nice to them. You can't, you know, be heavy-handed with them. I, I'm talking about programmers as well. So that put the genesis of the thought in my mind. By the time we actually got around to thinking about putting any words down, that had become a cliche. There were even television commercials about it. Mm. Uh, but uh, but the it's still, you know, the need for how do you manage these creative individuals was still there. Okay. And with the experience that you've got, and this is quite a thick book, I mean, there's, 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 there's a good substance here. Can you give us some of the nuggets, starting off with things like, okay, how do you interview people? How do you find people who you think are going to be good programmers? Do you test for capability, or do you assume that that's there and you test for something else? What, what, what do you look for? Let me, let me start with, the, with, with what we with with how this came about for us because okay. the center section so you can see that there's yep. a a creamy center there yep. that uh uh is is rules of thumb and nuggets of wisdom and right. over the course of 12 years of of having breakfast together every every 3 or 4 or 5 weeks Mickey and I were, found ourselves trying to solve each other's management challenges with yep. our programming teams but also trading rules of thumb and trading uh, you know the the kinds of things that uh, you know adding programmers to a late project makes it later. Which yes, that Fred, was, that Bro was which, interesting. Which, which Fred Brooks yeah. said Fred yeah. Brooks. in the classic, famous Brooks yeah. law, man, uh, uh, mythical man month. Uh, and we began. We had both been collecting rules of thumb and nuggets of wisdom. And Mickey had the thought of, you know, why don't we why don't we share our collection of rules of thumb, thumb and nuggets of wisdom? Mm -hmm. And it actually started out as that was what the book was going to be, just okay. a collection of these things. But as we thought about it and looked at some of the books, uh, there was, we actually saw a need for some of our our experiences that we could share. And then in addition, we had been collecting tools we used to help manage over the years, so we said, well, we could include some of those on our website for people who buy the book. So it actually, the subtitle of the book is Rules, Tools, and... Uh, and Insights. Insights, Rules, yes. Tools, and Insights. Uh, for managing software people and teams. Right. Yeah. And so that's it's really three parts of the book. There's a set of rules of thumb and nuggets of wisdom. Uh, there's a, a set of tools. There's spreadsheets, uh, you know, uh, personnel evaluation forms, things that we had to create that we share. And then again, the insights from our management over we have combined between us, you know, seventy years of developing software and and managing people. So as okay. we started as we started thinking about it, we realized that we needed to start with who are programmers. Mm. And so the the first two chapters are really about who are programmers, why and and why are they hard to manage, and then and then we go into so how do you recruit programmers, which. Um, 
our early readers have been really enthusiastic about the 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 information insights that we've gathered and shared were, with regard to recruiting programmers, and then we talk about well, how do you start programmers for can, their first yeah. day. Yeah, can, can, can you tell us how do you recruit quality programmers then? Well, you know, it, <clears throat> of course, it depends on the cycles of time too. Uh, some cycles, it's almost impossible to recruit programmers. You know, any warm body will almost do. Of course, mm -hmm. that's one of the worst things you can do. But you get almost that desperate. You know, in other cycles, it's it's a lot easier. You know, the talent on the streets. But uh, quite frankly, one of the best rules uh, is to through your networks. You know, keeping an active network, the SV forums mm -hmm. and other professional societies that Ron and I both both are affiliated with. You know, networking that way, keeping a very active Rolodex of people you meet. I've hired people years after I first interviewed them or met them, you know, by keeping track of them and going back. So right. two, two rules of thumb that, that we share from ourselves are one, hiring is the most important job that a, that a manager will do. Hmm. And it's the most important job because if you get it right, then you, you're hiring programmers who are self-starting, they're team players, they work well with others. They can literally climb into the microprocessor and listen to the gates open and close. They write code at a level of productivity that's an order of magnitude more than their peers. They, everything, everything works and everything clicks. If you fail at it, if you make the wrong decision and hire the per wrong person, then you've got, um, you've got problems for months and years of dissension on your team and um, uh, programmers who are undercutting your leadership and who are uh, divisive and not team players. And, and it's literally the most important. So that's one rule of thumb is it's your most important job. The second is always be recruiting. And always be recruiting huh. in, uh, and I'll give you an example. I was at Razorfish. And, uh, and, and Razorfish in San Francisco was literally a Java and open source shop. Mm -hmm. we, we, we did almost no Microsoft uh, uh, work at the time. So you know, this was six or seven years ago. And one of the, you know, micro, uh, Razorfish is a, is a shop that's got graphics design and it's got strategists and it has um, software development and it has a number of different uh, methodologies and, and uh, domains involved in it. And one of the graphics people brought me a resume and it was a Microsoft.net programmer. And I thought, well, that's great. But I looked at this resume and said, boy, if we ever have a .NET project, this is a resume. And, and I, I started a new folder. I had only been there for two weeks and, and here's this person bringing me this resume. A week later, we had our first .NET product project right and 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 I had the resume in my in my file to be able to do that with and, and, it, and it comes down to that always be recruiting you're always connecting as Mickey said through whether it's through the SV forums of the world mm -hmm. and the and the ACMs of the world and the uh, meetups that you go to and the and through your network and you're constantly being in touch with and and figuring out who 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 you'd like to recruit Right. Now, the, the, the per perception certainly that you get from papers and blogs and things of, of a programmer is, is a hacker who's, who's, who's an introverted geek who, who's got no social skills, um, you know, doesn't want to mix that. Is this really the case? Um, I was a programmer once. Uh, um, or, or is that just, just a myth? Some of us could grow out of it. <laughs> yeah, but, but I, I think one of the one of the lines from the book is you know you can you can tell a pro, an introvert extroverted programmer because he's the one who looks at your shoes, your, your shoes. shoes rather than his own <laughs> shoes. Yeah. 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 yeah, So I mean you know the the unfortunately a, a lot of the uh, stereotypes are true. Uh, some of the best programmers I've ever had have been extremely introverted. You know. Uh, also a little edgy and tough to manage on occasion, and they've right. also been worth it. Uh, but not all that are that way. I mean, there's like all personality, there's a blend. Right. Yeah, but, and, and, I've, and I've had a, a really great programmer who worked for me who was just over the scale on the extrovert side, too. Right. So it, it, it is a blend, and, uh, and ideally you get that blend, you get a blend of people on a team who can work together. Right. And, and 
um, getting that mix right is part of the part of the challenge of, of managing. Now, there was a comment in here by somebody who was at a managerial level and had long been, been, been away from actually programming. He said and he couldn't ask people to code and he would recognize anything. He said he, he asked three, three questions about people. Are you a mathematician? Are you a mu mu musician? Have you ever had anything to do with wireless toys? And he said, if they got two out of those, if they got one out of the three, they were good. If two out of the three, they were really good. If they got three out of the three, they were 20 times better than anybody. <laughs> Why is that? I mean, what are the attributes there that you're looking for? You know, I'm not sure that every manager would agree that that's, a, that that's the right criteria <laughs> for choosing sure programmers. But it, but it worked for him, yeah. and, uh, and it was one of the reasons that we included it, is that there's such a wide spread of rules of thumb that work for, for programming managers, and you've got to find the ones that work for you. And, and he found the ones that work for him. Um, you know, Mickey was talking about musicians earlier. Um, all three of us have been musicians yep. here on this stage, and all three yeah. of us have been programmers. Yeah. Mickey's been a professional musician. And I think you have as well, yes. if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. I um, opted out of that, but uh, there's there. You know, mus music is a left brain, right brain kind of activity, and so is programming. It's mm. it's. I think engineering's a, is very left brain, but the creativity side of programming is very right brain. And being able to pull those two things together happens to come together in the same way for musicians and and programmers. And it's one of the things that we both noticed through our careers is that an awful lot of times the great programmers are also musicians. And uh, as to uh, doing radio controlled uh, models and, uh, uh, and and flying wireless things I'm, I, and wireless toys, I don't know what the connection is, but <laughs> but uh, you know we it, I think it's got to do with toys and playing and and. The detail, that, maybe, and, and getting in detail, detail and, and, the small things. Oh, and yeah. programming being a combination of detail and fun and yeah. the excitement of launching things. And um, now that's that's a nice segue into how do you motivate programmers and how do you measure them? And it's easy with salespeople. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh, right. They how make the numbers you, or not? Absolutely. Yep. How do you do it with programmers? Mickey, I mean, you've, you've been on some very complex projects. So motivating programmers is, we'll start with that. I, I think that um, we'll, we'll talk about motivation and demotivation. Okay. <clears throat> One of the things you have to do, in fact, we went over several motivational uh, theories in the book just to provide some background on that. And when we kind of adapted one of those uh, to our own uh, our own philosophy, but but you've got a set of basic fundamental factors that you've got to get right mm -hmm. to motivate people. For example, you know, the salary's got to be okay. If it's completely wrong, then you're going to have a problem. Uh, you've got to provide a good working condition. Ideally, you've got to take and have a, a reasonable workspace and machines mm -hmm. and and projects that are defined. You know. You got to have the the fundamental factors right. So if you don't have those right, then it erodes anything you try to do in motivation. Okay. So once you get the fundamentals right, then you can work on motivating. And there, I mean, one of the one of the single biggest things that uh, we've experienced ourselves is that when you've got something that's going to change the world, and even in some small way, it makes a big difference. In fact, we think that's one of the biggest motivators. Okay. So it's not you telling somebody what they have to do. It's painting the vision, and of course, Steve Jobs was among the best at this, right? Uh, and others as well. Uh, so there are a series of factors like that. One of the others is I believe that uh, to motivate your team well, they have to respect you, technical respect. They may not respect the way you dress. They may not like the car you drive. They may not like who you are as a person. But if they respect you technically, then you have a chance to actually motivate them to do great things and manage them. Okay, so that tends to indicate if you're going to be a manager of programmers, you've got to have been a programmer in the past at some stage. You know, it's not a hard and fast rule because some people can rise above it, but I think it's a, a lot steeper hill. Okay, Ron, have you got any? No, you... I, I I totally agree. The uh, and and you know both of us have been programmers, but of the of managers we've seen succeed, it's it's a majority of the time they've been programmers. 
and it's getting that respect of the of of the team that they're leading. Uh, but you know, Mickey's right about the making a difference in the world. I mean, it, it is a is a huge motivator. It's what gets me up in the morning. It's what makes me want to. You know, when I yep. was at when I was at Apple, and I and um, I made my transition from programming to management at Apple. It was that no. It was that mission that we were going to change the world. Okay. And it was that's that's an exciting thing to be part of. What about the measurement side of it? I mean, I've got a story uh, that, that, that a well-known VC has told me that uh, when he left college, no, he was still actually in college. He did his first company, and this was doing financial software for PCs, which was just coming out at that time. And he had a contract to provide software for Dow Jones. And they recruited a bunch of programmers and they got everything going. And every time he'd go in there and say, is it ready yet? They'd say, next week. We're 95% there, next week. And eventually, Dow Jones came and closed it all down because it just couldn't fly. And he had no way to measure what was going on. He was raw and young, he didn't know. Uh, so how, how do you measure? What is happening? You see, you can you can measure lines of code written, but that isn't a isn't a good thing. No, that's a terrible thing. In fact, we we share a story uh, in in our book. Uh, one of the great Apple programmers, uh, uh, when he was working on the Lisa, yep. Uh, management came in and said, "We're going to we're going to measure your productivity by the number of lines of code you write." The next week, he went and removed two thousand lines of code and made the Lisa. Made QuickDraw and Elisa work much better, Which much more efficiently, yeah. much more productively, yeah. much much uh, much quicker. And and he wrote down his number of lines of code for the week as minus two thousand. Right. The uh, lines of code is a terrible measure, and and in fact, there's no good measure other than a really good engineering manager, a really good software development so, manager. Now there is there is one measure. All right. That I'm that I'm beginning to look at, which is in in the world of agile, we we um, develop stories. Okay. So we talk about features in terms of stories. So if you and and we and we count points behind those. So some people are saying, well, maybe we should count points. I think that's a terrible idea, and uh, and it's partly because points are different for every team and points are different for every Agile project. But the interesting thing about measuring it in terms of stories is, and, 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 and I'll go back to points, customers don't care about points. But customers do care about stories. Which align to features. Which basically. align to features. So one of, the, one, of mm. the, uh, one of the dangers, one of the things you need to realize about motivating anybody is that what you reward has side effects. And if you start re rewarding stories, you'll have this side effect that stories will get smaller Yep. so that you can do more stories. Well, actually, that's a good thing in the Agile world okay. is having smaller stories. They tend to balloon. So if you can drive stories smaller, that's a good thing because, because you, can, you get this cadence where you're delivering story after story after story. And if you can increase the cadence, that's a positive thing, even if it's because the stories are smaller. So it, it's got positive side effects by measuring it by stories. But that's really the only measure outside of, uh, so, so to your point, I went into a company, uh, it was the company I went to after Berkeley Systems that had exactly that situation. The, the developers had been telling management that they were going to deliver in two weeks for the previous six months. Right. They were supposed to have delivered a year before, and and my first job was to figure out when they were when they were going to deliver. It was July. They were going to deliver in February. My gut said they're going to deliver in February. There's no way with the number of features that that are left and the amount of work that's left that they're going to deliver before February. This is eight months down the road, roughly. Our sponsor said. We're going to shut off the money in three. You've got to ship something in three. Our job as a management team was to figure out what we could ship in three. And we did that 
we you know, one of the, the thing the thing that uh, one of the things that people don't realize is that programmers love to ship software. It's not that they it's not that they're trying to, in, in most cases it's not that they're trying to drag it along. Getting things out the door and into the hands of customers serves that that fundamental need of making a difference. So why do so many projects go on so long and over time? And it is the it, it's it's ninety five percent there. Surely there's got to be a better way to do, to measure. So there are a huge number of things that cause projects to fail. Requirements uh, is is by far the worst. And the, getting them right and getting them narrow enough, you know, and then. And not allowing feature creep on them, which is, of course, what happens all too often. And okay. getting them well specified, yep. and getting them small enough, and getting and you know breaking down breaking down features and projects into small chunks, making making uh, a set of deliverables, getting a, a, a development cadence going, getting the the motion motion and the movement and the I like the motion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that too. Uh, uh, rigor. Yep. Um, Communication, communication both within the team and communication between the team and the rest of the uh, the rest of the organization. You know, it's interesting that there have been really two trends in the last ten years that are at odds with each other. One of them being agile programming, which says let's put everybody in the same room, including the product owner and mm -hmm. QA and and developers and the uh, even the customer if you can. Yep. And uh, and at the same time, um, this other trend, which is let's have distributed teams, and we're going to outsource, and yep. we'll have teams all over the world, and you know I've, I've managed a team of programmers where there are no two programmers in the same city. Right. So I, you know those are really at odds with each other, and it's a real challenge to pull <laughs> off both of them. And teams, the size of teams is an interesting area. There's some comments about that in, in the book as well. Is there an optimum size for teams? Is there, you know, are there good sizes? Are there bad sizes? Tell me about teams. Tell me about teams. Well, you know, <laughs> it depends on the project, of course, because some projects, you know, like the Manhattan Project, would require more than three people. Right. But, <laughs> but I personally believe that if for a modest-sized project, three people will outprogram a team of, you know, a dozen any time. Because the communication is small, if they've got a good cadence going, you know, three is the ideal number of people on a project. So, what happens when you hear of companies that have got thousands of programmers on a project? Uh, it boggles my mind. Well, it, be it becomes a management challenge, and right. it becomes it becomes a project management challenge. So, it's less about managing the people than managing the project. About breaking it down into into pieces that work together and that can be worked. Find the interfaces and yeah. making sure it all fits together. Yeah. I mean, That's right. pro some projects do require lots of people, but you know you've got to divide and conquer. Okay, you know? we've only got one minute left, so. Do you have a couple of, of nuggets of wisdom? You, you do have a lot in the middle section of the book that you could share with, with people watching the show that might be helpful to them in, in, uh, in, in working with programmers. <sighs> so many. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, I go back to hire the right people and your job is easy. Right. You know, if, if you don't hire the right people, the wrong people are going to suck up all of your time and, not, and take it away from the people you should be focusing on, which are the great People with great so, so, so you're in with Guy Ka Ka Kawasaki. Here. Don't hire bozos. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay. In fact, we <laughs> we refer to got that a, here. Got a section of the book about it yeah. or two. Okay, and, and Ron, what about you? So I th I think uh, yeah, similar to Mickey's, make make hiring your number one priority and always be recruiting. Okay, yeah. gentlemen, we've we've run very quickly out of time. It's gone far too fast. Unfortunately, there's a low bar I'd like to ask you about, but this is a great book. It's 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 enjoyable. It's it's, it's entertaining. It's engaging, and it's got some really good wisdom in it. So I highly recommend it. Thank you for doing it. Thanks so much. And it's uh, good night from me, Chris Gill, and uh, I hope to see you again next month. <laughs>